Hi, uh, so thank you very much all of you for, for being here today and thanks for all the Casual Connect team for organizing all of this. Uh, it's been great, thanks a lot. Uh, so I'm Karentin uh, Selt, I'm the head of publishing at Voodoo and this is Alex, Alexander Shea, hey guys. Uh, publishing manager at Voodoo. So I'm here, we are here today to talk to you uh, about Voodoo and the way we work with, uh, with um, developers around the world and how we help them uh, live from their passion and make hit games. So to give you a bit of background, um, at the moment at Voodoo, we work with uh, lots of developers around the world, North America, Europe, Asia, and uh, with them we have been fortunate enough to achieve tremendous success. So to illustrate this, uh, we've looked at the top charts over the past six months, one year, on the US iOS, and uh, we've seen that Voodoo games represent 20% of the top 50 games, 25% of the top 20 games, and actually 30% of the top five games on average over the last six months to a year. So that success has only been made possible thanks to the incredible work we've been doing in the publishing team and Voodoo more generally, um, the incredible work we've been doing with uh, truly unique and very, very talented studios worldwide. At the moment, um, we've been working with over 40 studios who've launched hit games with us. Each studio, before making a hit game, has, on average, had to go through 10 prototypes with us. And each hit game represents $1 million plus per hit for the studio. So Voodoo's mission statement is really this, to help studios reach their full potential. And Voodoo really operates uh, in a different way, in a new and disruptive way compared to more traditional publishers. We don't focus on the games that developers send us, we focus on the people that we meet. We focus on the talent, the creative talent, and the innovative talent that the studios can provide. And that's really the, 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 the basis on the relationship we see having with studios. We want to build a long-lasting relationship with every studio we work with, and it's really the talent and the relationship that matters to us. To allow studios to uh, make hit games, we give them two keys. The first key is a data-driven process, and I'll talk about that uh, in a moment. And the second key we give studios is open source knowledge, and Alex will uh, dive into that a little bit more. So, looking at the first key, which is the data-driven process at Voodoo. So at Voodoo, we're, we really are data fanatics. Whenever studios want to try a new feature, a new idea, or anything that's relevant to the gameplay, the core gameplay, we test it. We look at the data, we read the data, we interpret the data. And from that analysis, we help studios improve the gameplay, improve their prototypes, allow them to iterate in order to move them in the right direction and improve their KPIs each step of the way. So it's really a mixture between the emotion and the data at Voodoo that allows us to reach a hit game. And now over to Alex for the open source knowledge. Hey guys, um, so thanks a lot, Quentin, for uh, going through that. Uh, so we use this, um, this data-driven approach to inform how, we, um, how we're doing on prototypes, uh, and we apply these basic rules that I wanna go through quickly with you guys to improve prototypes that we receive from studios and work, working closely with those studios and building those relationships, we apply these uh, basic rules pretty methodically. Um, we do so in an open way, and so we're happy to share some of these insights with you guys today. Um, obviously, we do so much more extensively once we start working with studios one-on-one. -on -one. So the first, um, I would say, pillar to publishing hit games with Voodoo is really focusing on the ideation process. So what is the idea for your game? Why is it original? Why is it innovative? What's this idea? How is this idea going to differentiate you from the thousands of other prototypes that, that are on the market today. Um, and to do that, we encourage studios to do a few things. 
Uh, the first one is to benchmark the market actively. Always look at the top charts, the top five, the top 10, but also the top 200 for interesting gameplays. Um, and more recently, we've, we've been focusing even more on innovation. Um, and we've been encouraging studios to look at satisfying videos um, and satisfying experiences to start from an experience in order to build a prototype. Um, and you can use YouTube, Instagram, all, all that good stuff to get there. Uh, but more importantly, it's, it's vital that these studios have a process uh, internally whereby the whole team participates and um, comes up with maybe five or ten ideas for each prototype that they decide to build. So it really is about prioritizing to maximize your time as a studio. The second basic uh, pillar of our approach is to apply basic rules to each uh, prototype that we receive. Um, and the ones that we've identified so far are, is, is the game snackable? Meaning, can I play a couple of minutes, um, leave the game, and come back later, later that day? So is two minutes going to do it for me? Um, and am I going to be frustrated at the end of those two minutes to the extent that I won't be drawn back to the game? Uh, another one is uh, that the game be YouTubeable, which in our jargon basically means that you're able to portray the game in a, in a video, in a short video, and then um, our user acquisition teams then acquire users off the back of that video. So the game needs to be very clear, very easily understood, um, and just looking at a 10 second or 20 second video, you're able to tell, okay, that's, that's compelling, I, I wanna play that game. I'm gonna click through and install the game. Uh, another, another key rule uh, is that the game be system one, uh, which essentially means uh, the game is simple. I don't have to overthink things. Um, it's not necessarily gonna be a complex puzzle game, but I can uh, pretty much understand how to play the game after a few seconds. Uh, it may be tougher to be perfect at the game, but at least I can understand it quickly and I don't have to think extensively. The game is rewarding, satisfying, and it's not punitive on players. Um, a fourth rule, before I bore you all, is, uh, is really to focus on the gameplay. So um, looking at uh, the innovation in the game, why is this game gonna be different? And that goes back to the ideation process as well. Uh, and a final rule that we've applied across all of our, all of our games, all of our prototypes, uh, especially our hit games, is that the game be forgiving. Uh, so you wanna make sure that you're not punishing players, that they can come back to the game, as I mentioned, um, and that the game is you know, snackable, they can come back and maybe uh, one, two minute sessions, maybe four or five sessions a day. Um, now the next step, once we've established that a game you know, has all these ingredients, it's a good idea, it's a good gameplay, it's YouTubeable, it's snackable, it's system one, uh, it's forgiving, uh, is really applying some gameplay features on top as a layer. Uh, things like metagame features, uh, fever modes, uh, you know, is the game an incremental game, is there haptic in the game, is there zoning within each level? All those f features will help you get your day seven retention up to the publishing threshold. So we wanna make sure that people are playing for much more than one or two days. Um, and these are the kind of three pillars of our approach in order to get there. We work closely with studios to apply these meticulously to each game, and they apply differently to each game, so we're always here to help. Um, and a, as we mentioned, we, we're very much an open source company, which means that we share from day one with all of our studios uh, a set of tutorial videos um, uh, directly on a dashboard that, that enables studios to, uh, to learn a lot about everything we've learned. So uh, kind of expanding on each single point that we've touched on today and many more, um, we enable studios to learn quickly, to prototype fast, um, and, and to r really leverage these insights to publish multiple hit games. We also um, conduct weekly live streams where we keep our studios abreast of the latest trends and uh, the latest insights into maybe a hit game that we may have published recently or um, a feature that we've noticed is working well across our games. Uh, we also address all of our studios um, through Q&As in this, in this way um, on a weekly basis. And finally, our direct coaching approach means that when you have a game with high potential and, you, and you're working with us, we'll always be there to help you um, get it across the line uh, as much as we can uh, to make sure that, as Quentin mentioned, you're publishing not only a single hit, but multiple hits, and that each step of the way, for each hit, you're making over a million dollars on average. 
So that's just summarizing uh, what I've mentioned. The, the two key pil pillars, I guess, of, of um, our success is an open source knowledge. We share all our insights, everything we know about games with all the studios. And secondly, our data-driven process, which gives us the validation and the confidence to publish hit games uh, in high volumes. But you know, without, without the talent of studios, there's, there's no way we could get there. That is our basic uh, ingredient, and our relationship with them is absolutely key. Uh, so with that said, I think um, we're going to go into two case studies now. Uh, Quentin will go uh, into one case study. Um, you know, each, each of these case studies relates to a game with uh, millions and millions of downloads that we've uh, recently published. Thanks, Alex. So I'm going to talk to you about the story of TenQ. Uh, so TenQ is a bit of a love story between me and uh, Taishi Kobayashi. Taishi, just to say a few words about him, and hey Taishi, if you're watching, or if you will be watching this, hello. Um, Taishi is a solo developer, uh, works full time at, well, at the time, used to work full time at Dina in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, he's a software developer there, and that meant that working with us, he had to work at nights and at weekends, so he was working extra time, extra hard um, to work with us, and it was really great. Uh, on top of that, oh, I, I don't speak Japanese, and he doesn't speak English, so Google Translate was a great friend in this instance. Uh, that was all fine. You know, there were a few rocky translations here and there, but it was all good. Um, so Taishi Kobayashi built TenQ, and the first version of TenQ looks like that on the left. You see the little GIF there. So, TenQ is the, uh, the classic marble that you have to navigate through a puzzle, uh, through a maze. And it looked like that. Very, very pure uh, layout, very nice, very smooth, um, very uh, um, polished color contrasts, uh, and it looked fantastic. However, there were two main features that made it uh, really shit. Uh, the first one is uh, the timer, uh, and the second is uh, the gyrosphere. So the timer uh, was really aggressive. People were not comfortable playing it over a timer. It put a lot, a lot of pressure on them. The game was just not casual. And secondly, the gyrosphere, although you would think it's intuitive, people don't use it that much. There aren't that many top 100 games, I would think, with the gyrosphere mechanic in them. So you see the, the, the data we had on that game with those features. We had day one just below 35%, D7 under 10%, so really bad. Uh, but CPI was very promising, it was below 10 cents. And for that reason, the team decided, well, we've got to do something here. There's really a diamond in the rough. We have to work with Taishi. So we brainstormed with Taishi, uh, worked a lot, uh, despite all the, you know, the language barrier, the time difference, uh, and his uh, limited availability since he had a, a full-time job. Uh, we still came up with a second iteration so we did away with the, the, the timer, so there was no more stress on the players when they were playing the game. Uh, we added, uh, we, we removed the gyrosphere control and replaced that with a simple swipe control. And the additional innovative uh, feature we added was a falling down mechanic, where you go from one platform to the other. That seems very simple, or almost a, a why are we doing this kind of feature, but it really, really worked. Um, the reason we think it worked is because the traditional marble, na navigating a marble through a maze, everyone knows that and everyone's kind of used to it already, so there's nothing new to it. Uh, and adding that additional falling down feature did the trick. It was that sort of slight innovation we added to the game that did the trick. And you can see the data uh, from that second iteration. We managed to bring D1 up 15 percentage points, so from 35 to 50 and D7 up by five percentage points from 10 to 15. We also saw that CPI was slightly creeping up, but we were still happy with it. It was still very low. But we were not fully satisfied with that. Those are really good stats, but we thought we could bring it even further. So we did, enough, we did a further brainstorming sessions. Uh, we worked with Taishi a lot more, and we essentially we added a few more features that didn't work, but the, the big feature that did work was the leveling feature, which uh, Alex mentioned earlier as one of the metagame features we can add. So the leveling feature, you can, I'm not sure if you can see it, it's the bar at the very top, where you can see the levels and the progression bar filling up progressively. That really made the trick. D1 uh, was over 55% and D7 was over 22%. And the reason this worked is because ultra casual players really like the, um, uh, the feeling of progression and 
learning the game, being onboarded on the game super easily, starting off super slow, and then ramping up that difficulty curve bit by bit. People really like that, and it really allows lots of people to stay committed to the game on the long term. And that's it for thank you. Thanks, Quentin. So uh, let, me, let me finish off with uh, a quick case study of uh, another uh, hit that we launched recently. Um, and actually, there's a similar dynamic you'll see uh, within the game that was inspired by TenQ. So it's also an interesting learning. Um, the, the story behind this is that we worked on a prototype with a, uh, a studio uh, uh, called Jan Kovac, uh, an independent developer um, who had uh, created multiple prototypes. And this was, um, you know, this was one with, with high potential. So it had good retention um, and, and, and good CPI, actually. So good cost per install. It was fairly cheap for us to, to get new users. Uh, but the issue is that we weren't able to get our day seven retention. So how many people are we getting in after seven days? Those were, that was an insufficient number uh, for us to publish the game. Uh, so we, we wanted to work closely with, with Jan to, to get there. Uh, the first thing that we did um, is that we noticed that the, the game was actually, um, you know, it was, as, as I mentioned, it was, the balancing was off. It was too difficult. Uh, so you had a single ball. If you hit an obstacle, uh, you would die. Um, and the controls were complex. You can tell on the side there's a power control as well as the uh, lateral directional. Uh, and the last thing is that the gameplay was tricky. Like, it was hard to tell what is my score, what is my aim uh, when I, by the time I get to the target. Uh, so we took that game. We saw there was high potential. We could tell from the CPI, uh, which is at uh, 21 cents originally, that players would want to play this game. And we just couldn't keep them in the game long enough. Uh, our second step was to simplify the game. We made sure that the controls were simple. We removed the power control. Uh, we made sure that the game was more forgiving by creating a snake dynamic, whereby if you hit an obstacle, you can still course correct um, and survive. Uh, and then the aim at the end was more simple. You could tell there was a, a target uh, that clearly you needed to hit the center of um, to get the most amount of points. Unfortunately, this wasn't enough, and that's uh, sometimes the case when you're not adding anything new to a game. Um, you know, when you're just tweaking some of these basic rules um, or even extra features, um, it's, it can be hard to get to the publishing thresholds. Um, the best approach we find, uh, you know, just for, as for 10Q, is to add innovation uh, and uh, originality to the game. And so we actually parked this prototype for a little while. Um, you know, our, our day seven retention wasn't high enough, our day one retention wasn't high enough, our CPI was too high at, at 50 cents. Um, and, uh, you know, one day we came up with an idea um, that, that would really dramatically change the game, and that was based on 10Q. And it was a very small tweak to the game, actually. The game had already been built, basically. Um, but by adding this touch of uh, uh, this extra feature within the game, which is that we link each level to each other through a hole and a visual continuity, um, of the snake going through, a bit like in Thank You, uh, but with uh, you know, uh, s this continuity that really pulls you into the game through each level. Um, that actually helped us on the visual front, so our cost per install came down, and actually you know, users were more engaged with the game, and they felt that there was uh, more purpose to the game. And um, we also found that people were staying in uh, each session, each game, and progressing through the levels more effectively, which meant that the, the game sessions were longer. Uh, so anyways, that, that's, um, that's it for our case studies. Let me just um, pass the, uh, the press back to Quentin. Thanks a lot, Alex. Um, so there's one last thing I wanted to mention very quickly, if I have, I've got one minute, perfect. Uh, so as you all know, uh, Voodoo is a French company based in Paris. Uh, I've got a map here. So we're based in Paris, sort of in Paris. We then opened up a, a small satellite office in the south of France, uh, in Montpellier. I've got an amazing team of developers there. Those are the guys that build paper.io, one and two, uh, hall.io. And uh, so we've had a lot of success just from those two offices. Uh, but Voodoo is growing and is now opening up a new office, and I'm happy to announce that today. We're opening up in Berlin, in Germany, uh, by the end of the year, and we're hiring. So thanks a lot. Hello. Um, I have two questions, if it's OK. All right, so first uh, short question. Uh, you, are, uh, you had this CPI, and uh, I'm interested, to, is it like global average or some tire of countries? Like, 
Like, I mean, what was the CPI numbers for the global average or some specific countries? Uh, I'll address that. So we look at, um, we actually, in testing, we only uh, test in a certain amount of geographies. Um, and so we look at the CPI there. And, um, you know, these CPIs are in, in a testing phase with, uh, we test games without commercials. And those CPIs aren't realistic in the sense that when you scale a game, the CPI always comes up. Uh, you know, drastically, uh, whether it's, you know, in tier one countries, tier two countries, but it, you're always going to face higher CPIs in, say, the United States than you might in, say, Russia, for example, just because of the nature of your end user. So this was just for percentage references, how it was changing? Yeah, we look yeah. at the relative change. Um, that's important to us, and we, we always stay consistent with the measurements we use. Okay, and another question. Uh, I'd like to hear uh, at, w at what stage can we, at what stage of game development can we get in touch with you to be like successful? Like, w when do you start to accept? At what stage? Pro prototype phase. So very very early on. So when we have some playable prototype, we can get in touch with you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, as with 10Q, like there was a sort of brainstorming session, not just for 10Q, but for other game ideas, and we still. This is working right, yeah. So we do a lot of brainstorming for any other ideas, not just the prototype you come to us with. Thanks. Uh, hi. Uh, so I have a question. As I understand, understood, uh, you are taking good concepts that you like and you tweak it and uh, make it uh, its best, like to uh, to use its uh, all potential that uh, that gameplay has. So I am wondering, uh, what is your like? Uh, how well can you predict a game's success? Uh, like uh, how mm, well uh, you have statistics that uh, you choose a game and uh, you uh, make uh, in, in it work and uh, you advertise it in your network and uh, how big precision do you have uh, of game success? You pr probably have some kind of index value that uh, this game will be really good, great, or something like that. Oh, man, if you have that tool, come work with us. Like, <laughs> I don't, we don't have that. We don't have that uh, foresight into the future. We just don't know what works, right? And that's why we really have to follow up this data process where we test everything. There's, there's really no way to know if game A versus game B is going to be a success. Like, sure, we can sort of say this game has more chances than this game to be a success, yes. but that's just our gut feeling, and it's, it's gotten pretty good over time, but at the end of the day, data is king, and we have to, we have to follow that. Okay, thank you. Uh, one question. Uh, uh, what is the lifetime of these super casual games? Are they lasting like for a few months, for a year, or it may be a several years? So, That's, that's a really good question. Um, we don't really know yet, because... <laughs> We've been doing this for a couple of years, and games that we launched that were successful you know, 18 months ago are still in the top 50, yeah. some of them. If you take Snake vs. Block, um, you know, that, that game continues to attract thousands of users every day. Um, and the truth is that we, we tend to have long-term contracts with, with studios and also on a game-by-game -game basis because we want to make sure that the success of the game is carried through its lifetime. Um, so it could be, it could be, you know, it, it really depends on the quality of the game. But the hit games that we publish uh, tend to have a relatively long lifespan. Uh, occasionally, you'll see in the top charts some games go up and down. Um, our, our games tend to have a more stable performance through time. Thank you. Hi, so there's a limited number of mechanics that you can use for hyper-casual games, and they often differentiate themselves by using um, uh, different aesthetics. Is there any way that uh, you find those aesthetics or like colors or, or, or whatever before launching the game or before uh, going to phase two? Like, I don't know, maybe some fake uh, campaigns on Facebook with fake assets, stuff like that. I think we understood that. So, are you asking whether we want to test um, yeah, like test CPI through a fake? Um, yeah, like you have idea for the game, like for the mechanics. But uh, you, for example, you can use um, 
you can apply different dif different uh, different styles, different visual styles to it. How do you find that? That's really up to the, the developers' creativity and innovation. Like we, we don't force them to do anything. Obviously, we make recommendations on what could work or not. Uh, but when it comes to sort of assets and art, uh, for us, that, is, that hasn't, it has an impact on, on our KPIs, but it doesn't have the biggest impact on KPIs. So you said earlier, yeah, and you're right, that there are a limited number of gameplay concepts in Ultra Casual, and that's completely true. But from that limited... Uh, um, number of concepts, there's an infinity of interpretations you can have. And that's what really we're pushing for all, our, our, all the studios we work with to, to really explore and try to innovate on that. Hello. When are you planning to launch your dashboard for the broader audience? Like, Sorry, for what? Uh, Two months ago, you told us uh, that you're planning to launch a website where everyone can sign up and test your game. But right, right now, it's like only by invites, right? But uh, do, do you have any dates when it will be available for public? Uh, sure. So um, just to make sure, you're, are you currently on the on the Voodoo dashboard? Yep. OK, great. Um, I think. Yeah, so you're right. So we, we are. So for everyone else who isn't in your situation, mm -hmm. uh, we have a current dashboard that we're updating to something new that will replace the old one ultimately. And so we've just we've just started the phase where we're testing it. So obviously we can't open it up to everyone because it'll probably crash within a minute. Uh, so we are testing it, uh, and we're making sure all the bugs work. Oh, sorry, do, are fixed. Uh, so the platform works, and we're aiming to hopefully get it out by the end of the year or early next year to really make really want to make a. a a thorough work job here to make sure that um, we have a dashboard that's open to everyone and that works and is bug-free. Thanks. And the last question from me. Uh, what user acquisition strategy do you implement to ensure exponential growth of your titles in so short period of time? So I think we, we lied a little bit when we said we were open source. Um, mm -hmm. That's company, company secret and unfortunately we can't disclose that sort of strategy here. OK, understandable. So thanks. Thanks a lot for this interesting thanks presentation. Lot.